Hi, everyone. Hey, it's great to see you. Really glad you're here. Always glad when we're together, but especially today as we begin the 24-7 series. In a few weeks, we're going to know Jesus better. We're going to love him more. And I'm really glad that you're here at the beginning of it. So a friend of mine leads a church in downtown Atlanta with a cool tradition. Each year, a week before Easter, the police restrict the traffic while the church uses the surrounding streets to reenact a scene from the life of Jesus. A man portrays Jesus riding on a donkey. Adults and children wave palm branches and lay them in front of Jesus, and people shout, Hosanna. And those actions likely sound familiar to you, and you may already know that they are tied to an event that we call the triumphal entry. It is a huge moment in the life of Jesus. It is recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the Holy Spirit is saying, do not miss this. I want you to catch this, which makes it a good place for us to begin a series on the final week of Jesus' life. Now, before we explore the triumphal entry in Matthew 21, I want us to step back a chapter to Matthew 20 because that's where we learn that what happened to Jesus during his final week was not unexpected. It was not a surprise to him. He did not play his cards wrong and pay the price with his life. It turns out he knew everything that was coming. Look at Matthew 20, verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed by the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Now, you've likely heard the news reports that Russian assassins are trying to kill the president of Ukraine. He has survived a dozen assassination attempts, and he continues to inspire his troops and his people. So if the Ukrainian president announced that he was traveling to Moscow to confront Putin and that he knew he would be tortured and he knew he would be killed when he got there, we would assume that he had lost his mind. But that is what Jesus is doing in the passage we're exploring today. Jesus would sometimes ask people not to broadcast his miracles or share his identity, but the time for discretion, the time for holding back was over for Jesus. Jesus was about to take the stage, and he was essentially saying, you can crown me or you can kill me. You can acknowledge me or you can eliminate me. You can accept me or you can execute me. And that is a sobering strategy and Jesus knows it is going to result in his death, but he goes all in by announcing his arrival in Jerusalem with a dramatic, a triumphant entry. Now look at the start of Matthew 21 where this happens. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. Now, look, you can try this at a car dealer, but <laughs> I'm guessing it's not going to turn out well for you. I mean, the Lord needs your BMW is a great line. But most car dealers are going to call that stealing. And yet somehow God made arrangements, and verse 4 explains why. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Jesus sends his friends to acquire a donkey from a, sta a stranger, and the man gives it to them. And maybe the man recognized these guys as followers of Jesus. Maybe the Holy Spirit performed some Jedi mind control here. Maybe there was an Uber donkey or Turo donkey app. I'm not sure exactly what was going on. Whatever the case, God arranged for Jesus to acquire this man's donkey so that he could 
fulfill this event. And why does it matter? It matters because the Jews knew their Old Testament scriptures better than many of us know our New Testament scriptures. And they knew Zechariah's prophecy about the Messiah riding a donkey. So this moment is about Jesus' identity. It is about his authority as the ultimate king. Jesus is announcing that he is the Messiah. And he was going to require the religious leaders to accept or reject him based on that claim. You know, in our last series, we talked about how Jesus used parables to cleverly disguise exactly what he was saying. His followers understood it. Other people didn't understand it. Well, that season, that style of communication is over for Jesus, and he is ready to claim his authority and to exercise his authority openly, and he is ready for the consequences. Friend, I don't believe this theme could be any more important to you and me and any more relevant to our world, because everyone in our world is trying to answer the question, who is in charge? And whether you've used these terms or not, all of us have asked and probably answered the question, who is in charge of my life? Are we in charge of our own lives? Are the politicians and the bureaucrats in charge of our lives? Is God in charge of our lives? Well, this passage reveals two answers to those questions, and those answers go together. They're equally important. The first answer is Jesus is king. Jesus is the king. Jesus is in charge. He is the authority over our lives. But the second part of the answer is this. Jesus is not the kind of king we expect. And if you only embrace one of these truths, if you only acknowledge that Jesus is king, but you haven't realized that Jesus is not the kind of king you will sometimes expect, then you will fall out of step with Jesus. You will miss it when Jesus is at work in this world and in your life, or you will think that Jesus is not actually the king because it doesn't seem like he's exercising authority. Some people get out of sync with God because they refuse to recognize Jesus is king. So they resist his authority, maybe even deny his identity, or maybe they try to have it both ways. They claim to believe in Jesus because they want the benefits of being a believer, but they do not allow Jesus to rule, to be the king over their lives. Other people who get out of sync with God do so because Jesus just surprises them, shocks them by the way he exercises his authority as king. He's not the kind of king that they want him to be or expect him to be. Now, we're reading from Matthew today. Luke's version of this event gives some more detail. And he writes, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus knew he had a destiny. He was determined to face that destiny. He knew there was going to be conflict, and he was prepared for it. That's what resolute means. But Luke also reveals that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Now, why would he weep? Because Jesus knew that many people would reject him. And realizing the consequences of people rejecting him brought Jesus to tears. Is that the kind of king that you imagine Jesus to be? Do you realize that Jesus is both confident and compassionate? That he is both confrontational and patient? Or is Jesus' style of authority perplexing, confusing for you? If you're in the same position that many people are today and many people in Jerusalem were in Jesus' time, you actually haven't received Jesus as king. You haven't made him king of your life. And I want you to know that above everything else, that saddens Jesus. That's why Jesus weeps. He's not gloating. He's not posing or flexing. He's not laughing maniacally. That is not Jesus' style, and it does not reflect his attitude toward you. Jesus is sad because he does not want you to live a life without the benefit of him being king. He does not want you to transition into eternal life without knowing him as king, because he knows the consequences are serious. He's sad about that. And if you want his help, 
You must say what the people of Jerusalem said as Jesus entered riding the donkey that day. Remember the word they used? Hosanna. Hosanna does not mean, you demand, Jesus. Hosanna does not mean, I'm on your side, Jesus. You know what Hosanna means? It means, save us. Save us, Jesus. Asking Jesus to save you requires humility. It requires an admission that you've gotten it wrong. Most of us are in defensive mode so often it's difficult for us to admit that we've gotten it wrong. It's difficult for us to say, save me, I need saved. When I was a lifeguard, I learned that kids will often cry for help the moment they get in trouble in the water. In fact, kids will sometimes yell for help before they're in trouble just to make sure you see they might get in trouble. But adults have this exaggerated sense of self-sufficiency. And sometimes adults will drown without saying a word, even though people are nearby. Friend, have you acknowledged that Jesus is the king and that you need him to save you? When's the last time you looked at Jesus and said, save me? You know, some of us want a king like today's British royalty, a king that we can venerate and applaud when it seems like the thing to do, but ignore when it doesn't. Jesus is not that kind of king. He is a humble king, and he is a sacrificial king. He is full of love and compassion, even to the point of weeping over you, but Jesus will not agree to be your figurehead king. He will not be a king of convenience or a king in name only. Jesus is a full-time king. He is a real king, an authoritative king, an awesome king, the king of kings. Jesus described himself as meek and humble, and he lived up to that description. But as humble as he was, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey was one of the busiest days of the year. Why did he choose that day? Because he wanted people to know he is king. Leading up to the Passover, Jerusalem was like Disney World on a school holiday. And if you've ever done that, you're groaning with me. Jesus knew that he would be visible to many people. Some scholars suggest that the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey was the day many worshipers would have been selecting lambs as sacrifices. Historians tell us 250,000 lambs were sacrificed in Jerusalem during the Passover season. And each one of those lambs represented a minimum of 10 people. So two and a half million people were descending on Jerusalem. And as they did, Jesus rode into Jerusalem in a way that signaled that he was fulfilling a messianic prophecy. And after he entered the city, Jesus went to the temple and he began driving out those who were exploiting people, exploiting the temple offerings and sacrifices for profit. He overturned their tables. He threw them out. He basically said, not in my house. He even used the phrase, my house. Only an owner kicks people out of the house. Only an owner, and Bobby Knight, if you're old enough to know who that is, throws furniture. And Jesus is claiming that kind of authority. He is claiming ownership of the temple. He is acting like a king. He is requiring the religious leaders who oppose him to respond to that claim. Now look, don't miss the obvious application of Jesus and the way he behaved in the temple. Because you and I are the temple now. We are are where God lives. And if Jesus had the authority to determine who and what could occupy a building, what type of activity could go on in a building, then you and I can be sure that he claims the same authority over our lives. If you're a believer, Jesus has a right to say to you, not in my house. And I'm not stretching this principle beyond what the Bible intends. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? 
you do not belong to yourself. I do not belong to myself. Will you say that with me? I do not belong to myself. Do you realize that? Do we live with that truth in mind? Because our culture teaches us to claim authority over our bodies, our choices, our money, our time, our opinions. We can even create our own truth, our culture teaches us. But if Jesus is king, all of your life, including your body, falls under his authority. Look, I realize that a lot of people are not interested in that kind of Jesus. We would like an easier version of Jesus. We want the meek and humble Jesus, the forgiving, the generous Jesus. And sometimes we have to admit we're not big fans of the authoritative in charge Jesus. We prefer Savior Jesus over Lord, Master Jesus. But Jesus will not allow himself to be subdivided. And he will not downgrade his agreement with you or with me to a less demanding version of what it means for Jesus to be king. And he will not sign treaties to agree to stay out of parts and segments of our lives that we don't want to yield to him. Jesus is the king and the king makes the rules. But it's important for us to realize that Jesus is also a king that defies expectations. Most of us re realize that some moments require a high quality, very thoughtful gesture, and anything less than that is just insufficient. It's an embarrassment. Years ago, I attended a wedding at which the groom played a practical joke on the bride. When the time came for him to give her a ring, he pulled out one of those giant candy <laughs> ring pops from his pocket. And at first, she gave him a look that said, I can't believe you're goofing off during our wedding. You are going to die on your wedding day. <laughs> but the crowd laughed so loudly, she decided that she would laugh along. Now, he slept in his car on his wedding night, but he got a laugh. <laughs> and that's what's important. A friend of mine was in a parade in which the winner of a local beauty pageant was to ride on the back of a classic convertible. We've all seen that kind of a scene in a parade. She was a pretty girl. The car was a gorgeous car. It was an ideal combination. But the girl's brother arranged for the driver of the car to arrive at the last minute in a rusted out rattle trap of a car just to see his sister's reaction which I cannot quote today because this is not the place for that. Look, ring pops and junkyard vehicles are not what we expect at special moments, special occasions. They don't fit the moment. And believe it or not, Jesus is intentionally orchestrating that kind of irony and contradiction as he participates in the triumphal entry. He's not doing it as a practical joke. He's doing it as a lesson to teach people that he is not the kind of king they might imagine. You see, Jesus does not obligate himself to meet our expectations in how he carries out his authority. He is the kind of king we need, but he is often not the kind of king we want or expect. No wonder Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, take my authority, Live under my authority and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. If you'll make him king, he will surprise you by what a generous, gracious king he is. Jesus has authority, but he's so humble in how he uses it, so much so that even some people who hate the idea of a king really love Jesus, and that's wise. None of the passages in our Bibles about the triumphal entry say it. But some of Jesus' disciples had to be disappointed in how this moment was unfolding. For Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on a laughably undersized donkey did not send the message the disciples wanted people to receive about Jesus. They wanted 
Jesus to take over. They wanted Jesus to be large and in charge, and they wanted to be in charge with Jesus. So to them, this just seemed like a missed opportunity. It was underwhelming, disappointing. And even though riding a donkey fulfilled a prophecy, they were ready for Jesus to flex a little. They wanted people to take Jesus more seriously. But instead, Jesus goes to what seems like ridiculous lengths to convey what a humble king he is. And this is a reminder that Jesus is not going to force himself into your life, and Jesus will not force himself into the boxes that we construct for him. He is beyond our metaphors. He blows up our categories, defies our expectations. Jesus has all the power, but he chooses to come in humility and weakness because that's how he wants to impress himself upon you. He proclaims himself to be king, and yet he allows himself to be crucified. And his words were full of paradoxical truth and surprising truth. He said things like, if you give up your life, then you will find it. If you try to hold on to it, then you will lose it. We don't have adjectives and categories for that kind of king. Friend, this is why you and I have to continually rediscover what it is like to live for God. This is why we need this place. It's why we need God's word. It's why we need other believers who are helping us figure out how to follow Jesus because he's not the kind of king we expect. It's not always intuitive. It doesn't work the way we anticipate. We have to give things away in order to be truly rich. We have to serve other people in order to have real influence. We have to seek the happiness of other people in order to experience true happiness. We have to die to ourselves in order to truly live. And all of those paradoxes are difficult to get right. It's the kind of life that a person can't live without a king. What would happen if you found a place later today to kneel because that's the proper posture before a king, isn't it? Even if you've never done this in your life, what if you found a quiet place later today and you knelt? What would happen if you told Jesus that you are weary of pretending to be the king or the queen of your own life? How would it change your life if you admitted how bad you are at being your own king and queen at times, and how much trouble it's gotten you into. What if you admitted to Jesus, I'm not good at ruling or reigning over my own words or my own thoughts or my own actions. I need a better king. What would happen if you looked at the man riding a donkey and said, Hosanna, save me? And what would happen if you invited Jesus into the temple of your life. That's what your life is. God wants it to be his temple. What if you said, Jesus, this is your house now, and you can clear out anything that offends you. You can banish anything that obscures God or exploits other people. You can exercise your authority. You can take over, and you can reign as king. What would happen if you said that, if you did that. And listen, some of you are so stressed out. Some of you worry so much, so often, so consistently, you do not know what it is like to be awake and not be worried. And some of you are angry because you can't control people. You can't control circumstances. You can't even control gas prices. If you could, you should. We can't control anything else. So what would happen if we surrendered the need to control everything or even to know how everything is going to work out and if we just decided that we would entrust all of it to the king? What if you dedicated the rest of your life to being a loyal subject, faithful servant? I mean, why have a king if you're not going to trust him to rule and to reign. Matthew doesn't note it, 
But both Mark and Luke tell us that this donkey Jesus rode into Jerusalem had never been ridden before. Have you ever tried to ride a horse, a donkey, some type of equestrian animal that had never been ridden before? So this unbroken animal that could have made a mess of this moment, I mean, imagine what a comedic read it would be if that donkey had gone wild. But the donkey chose to submit itself to Jesus. It allowed Jesus to decide where it would go and at what pace. And that makes me want to ask, what is stopping you and me from letting Jesus decide where we will go and at what pace we'll go? Before we leave, I want to challenge you with two prayers that I prayed for you leading up to today's message and that I'm going to pray for you in the days ahead. First, I pray that you will desire the best things Jesus can give you. I know you're asking Jesus for things, but my prayer for you is that in the coming days, you will learn to pray for the very best things Jesus can give you. When Jesus came to earth, there were people who wanted him to defeat the Romans that were occupying Palestine. And they could think of nothing better for Jesus to grant than freedom from the Romans. If Jesus had said, I'll, get, I'll grant you one wish, I'll give you one thing, most of them would have said, get Rome out of here. They were absolutely convinced that was the thing they needed most from God. So when the Roman soldiers killed Jesus, some of them could not help but believe that Jesus had failed them completely. But on this side of the cross, you and I can see that they were wrong. They were short-sighted. And by allowing himself to be crucified, Jesus did not lose. He won in the most important way imaginable. And as a result, he is able to grant to all who trust him the greatest gifts of all, victory over death, forgiveness of sins, eternal purpose. Jesus knew what he was doing. But our problem in prayer is a lot of times we're not asking for the best things Jesus can do for us. As poignant as this truth is, we make the same mistake. We convince ourselves that we know best what God needs to give us. God needs to give us the healing that we need or that someone we love really needs. God needs to give us more resources, more money. Hey, maybe even the lottery. Come on, God. He needs to give us the political results that we want, that we know will be best. He needs to give us the relationship that we want because if that was in place, everything else would fall into place. But what if our deepest desires, what if our most frequent requests of God are not what we need most? Friend, my prayer for you and for me is that God will help us desire the very best things Jesus can give us. Secondly, I've been praying and I'm going to pray that you will give God the one thing he desires most. Jesus went to great lengths at the triumphal entry to display his gentleness. I mean, he comes as king, but there are no weapons, no armor, no troops, no stallion, no brave heart battle cry for freedom. Conquering kings sometimes trampled people who got in the way of their processions, but children were able to place palm branches in front of Jesus as he slowly passed. So here is a king who wants and should rule every single life, and yet there is no show of force. Why? Because he wants you to choose him of your own free will. And that is something he will not take from you, and it is something only you can give him. And rather than intimidate you in the hope that you'll surrender to him, Jesus loves you in the hope that you will want to surrender to him. Your parents can point you to Jesus, but they can't give your life to Jesus. Your spouse and your friends can pray for you and encourage you and try to influence you, but no one other than you can give to Jesus what he wants most from you, and that is your life. Your church can add you to the database, but we can't add your name to the Lamb's book of life. That is your call, your decision, and it's what Jesus wants most from you.
Only you can give it. What God, what God desires most is for you to trust and follow Jesus and you're the only one who can choose it. And why would you do that? Because Jesus is gentle. He is generous. His love is drawing you to him. Listen to Romans 2 verse 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Do you see how God is trying to bring you to himself? Years ago, the producers of Sesame Street had a dilemma. Will Lee, the actor who played Mr. Hooper, passed away, and the producers were faced with the challenge of communicating to millions of children that he was gone. Child psychologists suggested that they not say Mr. Hooper got sick and died because children get sick and might think they're going to die. They didn't think it was a good idea. They also recommended that they not say Mr. Hooper got old and died because children might think their parents are old and that their parents are going to leave them soon. And they decided to avoid all spiritual concepts. They decided they would not say Mr. Hooper died and went to heaven. So the producers chose to simply say, Mr. Hooper is gone, he won't be back, and he'll be missed. The show was aired on Thanksgiving Day so parents could watch it with their kids and discuss it with them after. Well, in the show, Big Bird came out and said he had a picture for Mr. Hooper, and he couldn't wait to see him and give it to him. And someone said, Big Bird, remember, we told you Mr. Hooper died. And Big Bird said, oh, yeah, I forgot. And then he said, well, I'll give it to him when he comes back. And that's when one of the cast put an arm around Big Bird and said, Big Bird, Mr. Hooper isn't coming back. Why not? Big Bird asked innocently. The reply was, Big Bird, when people die, they don't come back. And that's all that was said about Mr. Hooper. I am so glad that that is not the end of our message. And I am so glad that we have a hope that is bigger than that. I'm glad that we have a promise that confronts the harsh reality of death. That's what Jesus was doing when he went to the cross. He was confronting death. Sin brought death into the world, and there is no sufficient answer for it. There is no total comfort in the face of it apart from Jesus Christ. But since Jesus is the king who entered Jerusalem, died on a cross, and rose from the dead, we can celebrate that he has conquered. You might even say he has triumphed over death.